Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Penn State College of Medicine Monkeypox Echo Series. We're delighted to have you join us again today. My name is Jackie. I'm a member of the Echo team. I'll start us off with our announcements and introductions and you know, kind of help keep things moving along in this session. A couple of my Echo colleagues are online. Um, in particular, we have Caitlin and Kara. So if you have any questions or problems throughout, please feel free to reach out to them. We also have Emily, and she's going to be helping us with our case today. Um, if you haven't done so yet, and especially if you're logged in with a name that's not identifiable, please put your name and email address into the chat for our record keeping purposes. If anyone else is joining with you, we ask that you also include their name or their names. Um, please stay muted unless you're speaking. You can use star six if you're dialing in from a phone or the microphone icon on your Zoom screen. Webcams are, of course, uh, encouraged if possible, but we we realize many of you are coming from clinics, so if not possible, that's fine. Um, feel free to use the chat or to raise your virtual hand throughout the session if you have questions or comments. Um, feel free to unmute when you are speaking. Um, we will be watching the chat. Um, please remember that as we're talking about cases, no personally identifiable information or PHI is allowed. We are recording these sessions for educational and quality improvement purposes. Once the session is over, I'll share some follow-up resources with you. We are also making the recordings available. In the spirit of Project Echoes, I'll teach all learn philosophy. We're always on a first name basis during our sessions. So today we're going to have a brief flash talk on monkeypox testing, quarantine, and infection control, and that will be by Casey Pinto. And then we're going to have a discussion of a case. That case actually is coming from the New England Journal of Medicine. Thank you, Emily, for pulling that together for us. So Emily will share the details and Casey will help facilitate the discussion. Um, and again, during the presentation and the case, feel free to put your questions into the chat. As I said, we do have some specialists online and they're going to help field questions. But remember, I'll teach all learn so everyone can share questions and answers. Um, please note that due to the nature of the monkeypox presentation, some of the images that you see in the case may be a bit graphic. Um, and before we get started and I turn things over, let's do introductions of our hub team. So I am going to start with Casey, if you want to unmute and tell us your role and what you're doing here today. Hi, I'm Casey Pinto. I'm an assistant professor at Penn State University in the Department of Epidemiology. And I also work as a nurse practitioner in infectious disease at UPMC, the competitor. So I'm here doing the flash talk and I talk really fast. So feel free to you know, raise your hands and slow me down. Thank you, Casey. Um, and Adam, who is jumping in again to help us on our hub team. Thank you, Adam. Sorry. I'm Adam Lake. Um, I'm a family doctor and HIV specialist in Lancaster. And uh, we have an, H, uh, an STD clinic and we're starting a little monkeypox clinic here. Um, and uh, yeah, happy to be here. All right, thank you, Adam. And just an FYI, um, Kat is on vacation, so we're not going to see her today. And Gavin is also, um, he is out of the state, he's out of the country, he's in Australia, didn't want to join us at 2 a.m. his time. So he did do a recording of a summary of the case. It's about seven minutes long, so we will include that recording for your viewing purposes in our follow-up resources. And with that, um, Casey, I am going to turn it over to you. I'm going to mute and you can take us off with our flash talk. We're good. Can you see this okay? Good ones, yep, thank you. All right, so I'm Casey Pinto. I've already introduced myself and today is the 21st. We have our typical project echo disclosures that we collect your registration, participation, questions, answers. Jackie already went over all of this and we will keep it all confidential. Nobody has any disclosures except me. Um, I did get a some funding from Becton Dickinson and Roche just to um, chair a session at one of the national STD conferences. So I do have to disclose that before I talk. So we'll get started. And again, I do talk really fast. So if I find, if you find I'm talking too fast, please feel free to send a message in the chat or raise your hand and I will do my best to slow down. So first, when we start, 
Um, we talked a little bit about who to test last week. So I want to talk more about the actual collecting process this week and what is your risk as the provider who's actually going to be the person who's collecting. So right now, what we know is that your risk is less than that of getting COVID, um, but they are still recommending that you're wearing full PPE and 95 gown, gloves, and face shield. And they do actually specify a tight fitting mask um, and don't qualify it as an N95, but I've seen everyone's surgical masks um, over the past two years. And I would argue that an N95 is probably the only mask that is tight fitting. Um, there are a couple groups and specifically that I want to mention because I think they're getting forgotten are immunocompromised groups who are also, who are always at the highest risk. If you have someone who's on your staff that is immunocompromised and will be doing testing, um, you may want to give them the option to opt out of that simply because their risk if they were to acquire monkeypox would be much higher than someone who is not immunocompromised. The other group is pregnant persons. Um, there is limited data on how monkeypox impacts pregnant persons, but the only case reports that we currently have show uh, high mortality of the fetus, regardless of the trimester that the pregnant person is in. So you may want to allow them to limit their risk. Now, I should also say that the risk, there has been very limited evidence of the risk of transmission to healthcare workers. So someone who's seeing monkeypox patients, they're saying that the risk is low as long as they're wearing adequate PPE, even those who haven't had PPE. The only study I could find was out of the UK where someone was wearing just gloves um, and a surgical mask and they did end up getting monkeypox, but that's the only case that I could um, find that's published. Now that doesn't mean we won't see more, um, but that's just what's published and that's why we're all being a little bit extra cautious with full PPE. So when you do the collection, they want dry, sterile synthetic swabs. It's really important you don't use cotton swabs. And they say any type of handle that can be cut or broken, but then um, CDC specifically says do not use wooden handles. So while it does say any type, I would err on what the CDC says and use your dry, dry sterile synthetic swabs without the wooden handles for your collection. It's either the viral or the universal transport medium. And here's an example. This is the Koban um, universal transport medium. Um, some other companies have viral transport medium. This is the one I'm most used to seeing. It's got the pink fluid in it with the red lid, but um, CDC has a whole link. And I do have these in the notes. When you get the slides, you can click directly to my links and see some images of other types of transport mediums. CDC is also recommending two swabs from each site, and they specifically wrote a disclaimer. If you collect more than 30 swabs, you can send them. You don't have to fill out all 30 forms. Now, I know that most of us are not collecting 30 swabs, um, maybe maybe two, uh, two swabs total when you're sending them off, uh, and I think that that's okay. I'm just telling you what CDC is saying. They want two swabs from each site on different parts of the body. Um, so the other thing is unroofing a lesion is, is not necessary. You know, if you've done herpes screening, typically we're saying you have to unroof that lesion, get that, but you actually don't have to do that here. You just have to swab the lesion long enough that you can pick up some DNA from there. Um, and then these must be refrigerated or frozen. So I gave you the temperatures here. This must be done within an hour of collection. So if you don't have a fridge on site or a freezer on site, you're probably not gonna be a site that's able to collect them unless you have a Quest courier that will pick them up within 30 minutes and get them chilled to the temperature that you need them. So who's running these tests? Um, oh, sorry. I tried to click in the chat to make sure I wasn't talking too fast. Uh, all right, so who's running the test? So right now, at least in our region, there are a few major hospital systems that have the capability to run these tests on site, and those will be your quickest. 
So because I practice at UPMC, I know that I can ship them to UPMC if I'm inpatient, because they're only doing inpatient only, and I'll get those results back in one to two days. Your local Department of Health is also running some tests. You have to call, you have to get approval. Um, and I know Adam can talk a little bit more about this process because he's done it. Um, and essentially what they'll do during the week, because on the weekend they can't really, their labs aren't open. Um, but during the week, they're telling me two to three days is the turnaround. Your outpatient labs, if you're doing this outpatient and you're shipping them to say Quest or LabCorp, those are the two who are running according to their websites. Um, and Quest says their turnaround time is two to three days, and LabCorp says their turnaround time is three to four days. Now, we talked a little bit about this last week. Quest specifically, they're working on running it out of a different lab, but right now transit time is part of the delay here because it has to be shipped out um, to the only lab in the country that's running it, which I don't remember off the top of my head which lab that is. It's in California. Yeah, the California lab. Um, and then finally, it's important to note that you cannot send a patient to an outpatient lab to get this test run. So Quest has these standalone outpatient labs. You cannot order a prescription and send a patient there because the CDC mandates that it must be a healthcare provider, not a laboratory professional collecting those swabs. All right. Casey, Casey, before we go into the poll, um, yes. can I, there are a couple of questions, um, actually Adam raised them. So Adam, do you wanna unmute and follow up on these questions so we don't lose them? Sure, um, I, I hear a lot about the cotton and wood, like not using those, and I've never really gotten a straight answer about why. I mean, do you know, is it because they're natural and they have DNA or is it because they're porous? I mean, I'm just trying to understand for my own reference. So what I could find on the CDC website was that they actually absorb the DNA. So there won't be enough mm -hmm. DNA to run the sample. It'll get absorbed into the wood or the cotton, which is why they only want the synthetic. And then mm -hmm. the two swabs, they wanted two separate viral transport media kits. Oh, wow. OK. But I think, what we're, I think what we're finding is that most of our patients, if we swab them, you know, we're getting a positive off of one swab. We don't need multiple swabs. We're seeing patients come in, high suspicion, we swab, we're not unroofing the lesion. There's enough DNA there that we are getting the positive results, especially in our patients with high suspicion. Should we go into the poll now? Thanks. Sure, go ahead. So if you wanna read through that and then I'll get the poll ready. So I, I wanted to set this poll up as kind of a way to set us off for isolation. Should we isolate? Should we not isolate? Is this the person we would isolate? So this is a cisgender male who has sex with men who engages in hookups with strangers. He received a message through a dating app that his partner five days prior tested positive for monkeypox. Partner got tested one day after they engaged in sexual activity. Patient does not have a rash but does have mild flu-like symptoms that started yesterday. So should you, would you isolate this patient? So I'll give another couple of seconds here. We're up to 55% of you. Thank you all who are responding. All right. So let me end this poll. Again, thank you. I'll share the results. And is everyone seeing the results? Yep. Okay. So it looks like overwhelmingly people felt that yes, this patient should isolate. We had a couple not sure's and a couple no's. And I think that that's very reasonable because 
mild flu-like symptoms could be indicative of something else, but we do know that someone who is exposed to monkeypox, their early symptoms could be a mi mild flu-like illness. And at that point, they actually would be considered contagious, so we would ask them to isolate. But it's always nice to see the majority saying yes to that. And... So here's CDC, um, their isolation and infection control at home. This is taken directly from their website, which was updated on August 11th, which, you know, I just screenshotted because it makes my life a little bit easier. But they, remain, they recommend people isolate at home for the duration of their illness. And we'll talk about the duration of the illness in a little bit. And while that might not be possible in all situations, they are prioritizing it to prevent transmission. They also say that this may change, but it hasn't changed since the monkeypox started. So I'd be intrigued to see how this changes based on what we know over the next couple of months, because it may. So what does isolation actually mean? They want you to not share bathrooms, not share furniture. They don't want you to share towels, sheets, or eating utensils. And they want you to avoid people, pets, and mammals. Um, you know, obviously, a family of five who has one bathroom, this is going to be incredibly difficult to not share bathrooms. The furniture thing is really difficult because I know the couches in my house are not easily cleanable. Um, and they do want you to use EPA approved cleaning agents. I did not list them here, but CDC has a nice list on their website. The last two points, this is to prevent auto inoculation. So they don't want you to shave and they don't want you to use contacts because it puts you at risk of if you shave over a lesion to spreading your monkeypox lesions to other areas um, and contact use, same thing. You don't wanna put a contact in your eye um, after you have possibly touched another monkeypox because you could get monkeypox in your eye. Good question. With those EPA approved cleaning agents, um, I've tried to look on that website and it, I mean, the, the list is kind of exhaustive. It is not user friendly. Do you have anything that you've specifically been recommending or one that, you know, is generally available off the top of your head or stuff that they shouldn't use? I mean, I, I wish it was more of a general rule of thumb instead of, you know, go to this website that has every cleaner imaginable on it. I typically recommend Clorox and I recommend the wipes because you just get those Clorox wipes, you pull them out, you can wipe down your surface and toss them. Um, what I don't recommend is, you know, I personally use this at home, the Myers cleaning spray, which doesn't have much in the way of cleaning. It just has those nice um, botanical smells. It's a little bit better than water. <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend that if you have monkeypox in your home. I recommend Clorox or Lysol. Those are typically the two that we've been recommending. Um, so isolation duration is two to four weeks, which as you can see is much longer than COVID. And since we don't have the nice COVID protections that we had, patients who end up with monkeypox are put at a higher risk for um, job insecurity or job loss if they have to take two to four weeks off for monkeypox. Um, so this is the breakdown from CDC of what each scab looks like. And at seven to 14 days, they're saying that these pustules should have crusted and scabbed over. And then it takes about another week before they start to fall off and that new skin forms underneath, which is why you're seeing patients for three to four weeks isolation because these haven't crusted over and that new skin hasn't formed underneath. But again, this is really incredibly subjective, requires providers eyeball in one way or another um, we do want to trust our patients, but sometimes they have to get back to work. So they'll just tell you like, yes, they're fine. Please write so I can come off isolation. Um, and they'll show you like the one that's healed and they've got 10 other ones that are not healed and have not scabbed and ha don't have that new skin forming underneath. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just laughing. Um, the, the new skin forming underneath do you do you have like a working definition or how you're you're interpreting that? And I can tell you kind of how we've operationalized it, but curious what 
what you've done? We've, um, you know, where right when a scab's about to fall off, that's kind of where I'm at. If that scab is like ready to fall off or easily picked off, then I would say that that's new skin formed underneath and go from there. But that's kind of the best I've gotten. And I'd be open to hear what you have to say. Yeah, we, we had somebody that there was a genital lesion and that, that something kept falling off like a crust or a scab. Um, so we ended up just telling him to put a Band-Aid on it after it fell off. And if that was wet an hour later, um, like had anything on the Band-Aid, then it wasn't healed. But otherwise it's you know, it, it's healed. Um, so if it's moist enough that it's discoloring a Band-Aid, I don't know, that was the best way I would do because, I mean, it's hard with pictures. You're not having them come in the office. Um, it's, this is, this seems like it's going to be really easy and then it's impossible to operationalize. And the CDC doesn't provide any further guidance on this. So we're all kind of guessing. So if anyone else on the call has seen this and has helped uh, get people off isolation. We're willing to hear, we'd love to hear what you're doing. So please put it in the chat or unmute. And then the other situation we ran into is somebody that had pretty severe proctitis and still had um, didn't have pain anymore, but he had some discharge and barely had any other skin lesions. He did have one and it healed pretty quickly, but he continued to have like some bloody discharge from his rectum. And it was really unclear, you know, do you, you know, we're not gonna see new skin. I'm not gonna have him take pictures of, you know, the internal anus <laughs> and send it to me. Like, I mean, yeah, it, again, that was kind of another case that, it was just really hard to say what to do. I mean, it's generally staying covered. It wasn't gonna be sexually active, but as long as you're wearing pants, I thought it was gonna be okay. Yeah, that kind of takes me to the next point. Um, and that might actually help answer specifically that one. If they had no other lesions, um, they didn't have upper respiratory symptoms and they could actually cover this really well. This is for the people who can't stay at home. And this is per CDC what they're suggesting. So if someone can't isolate at home, whether it be because they have to go to a provider's appointment to get tested, or they have um, a job that absolutely will not let them off, they risk losing it. You know, you have to take into account everyone's social determinants when trying to make recommendations like this, but they are recommending wearing a tight fitting mask, which during COVID I'm kind of okay with because enough people are wearing masks now that they don't look out of place. We're not holding any stigma again. Well, I mean, there's the stigma against the people who wear COVID masks, but you know, we're used to that now. Um, and then cover all parts of the rash with clothes. So if you, if the person has a rash on their hands, they should have gloves on. Um, if those gloves get soiled, they should take them off and put new gloves on. Um, if they're wearing cloth gloves, if they're wearing latex gloves or uh, plastic gloves, the nitrile gloves, then they shouldn't get soiled. They should be okay. But essentially all parts of the rash should be covered and they should wear a tight fitting mask. So in Adam's case, I would have suggested a tight fitting mask. Um, you know, I think in this case, you could get away with a surgical mask because that patient is less likely to be spreading it uh, upper respiratory. Um, and then just make sure that they don't have any soilage. So maybe wear a pad to prevent leaking. And then for those of you who have any questions about while a patient's in the hospital, this is best practice according to CDC, single room, private bathroom. If they have to be transported anywhere for testing, all the lesions should be covered. They should have a, a tight fitting mask. They are not requiring airborne isolation like they do with COVID, unless the patient's getting a procedure that requires, that has some sort of airborne 
um, component. So I gave the examples here of intubation, extubation, and bronchoscopy. And most of these have, most hospitals have rooms for bronchoscopy that would have the negative pressure requirements for airborne. And then PPE for healthcare providers is still your COVID PPE. They're recommending N95, your eye protection, gowns, and gloves. And then isolation for in the hospital, I recommend everyone check your own hospital. They may have different, but right now CDC says no isolation unless symptoms arise and outpatient, no isolation unless symptoms arise. So just keep a close eye. Should you get any symptoms, then you would consider isolation. And this is simply because there's not a lot of evidence to support that this is transmitted from patients to healthcare personnel, whereas during COVID, we saw this was transmitted very easily from patients to healthcare or personnel. And we are going, some people would say overboard on PPE. I think it's appropriate until we know more about how it spreads. Um, so that's it for me on this and we'll move along to the case. Yeah, before we, are there any questions for Casey? Feel free to put them into the chat. We'll give Emily a second here to get her slides up. Again, she's going to share some brief details of a case and then um, Adam and Casey will facilitate our discussion around that. Hey everyone, um, are you all seeing the uh, screen okay? Yes, thank you, Emily. Fantastic, thanks so much. So I found this really interesting case that I thought would spark some great discussion around um, the topics we covered in our wonderful flash talk. Um, and specifically, I'd love to hear some advice on determining when a, a testing is appropriate um, and best practices for contact tracing, quarantining and isolation. So I'm really excited to hear everybody's thoughts. So next slide, please. Um, so this case is from a 31-year-old Caucasian male who presented to the primary care clinic, um, resides in the United States, Massachusetts specifically, um, is in the, uh, identifies as homosexual and has several roommates. Um, additionally, they also have pets. Um, so I wanted to drop that in there as well because I know that is important. Um, the patient also reports recent travel to um, an urban area in Canada. And during this trip, the patient reports having unprotected sex with male partners, plural. Um, so we didn't get an exact number on that, um, but I'm assuming um, that it is more than one. And the partners that they did have um, do not report any um, symptoms or they don't um, have any similar presentation to the patient. Um, in terms of past medical history, the patient reports um, oral herpes uh, simplex virus and um, uses um, antivirals as, as needed for that. Um, and they also have a history of secondary syphilis that's been diagnosed, I think it was over like a decade ago, um, but important to note in here as well. I did um, list some current medications there as well. They are on a prep regimen. Um, those two medications there, those first bullets. And again, um, the third bullet related to that HSV um, diagnosis that seems to be recurrent. Um, so in terms of first symptom development, they uh, develop these itchy white bumps around the anus um, that really were not, uh, were really unspecific um, and presented to a primary care clinic with these, these concerning um, bumps. Uh, the provider conducted several tests, um, including an HIV screen, syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, and preemptively um, started them on uh, penicillin and told them they can take the, their, their medication in the event that this was um, a manifestation of HSV. Um, so on here, you can see uh, pictures of the white bumps around the anus. They also developed um, a painless ulcer on the, uh, on the penis, excuse me. And next slide, please. So unfortunately, um, this, this patient developed um, more severe symptoms and had to actually present to the hospital. Um, so upon a presentation to the hospital, um, they have painful proctitis with rectal bleeding. Um, this discharge they're also experiencing is malodorous. 
Um, they are experiencing fever, chills, and drenching sweats, um, some swollen lymph nodes in the groin and just systemically, um, as well as scattered vesicular lesions on the body. Um, as you can see in these pictures, they're everywhere from the shoulders to the fingers to the palms. Um, we did have some test results come back. Um, and we had negative for HIV, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, but we did have a positive uh, syphilis screen uh, started on some medications there, as you can see. Um, and at this point, the individual, the, the, the provider did decide to order a monkeypox um, test, but did not do so until the individual was at the hospital with severe symptoms. Um, so new symptoms. Uh, severe symptoms and has presented to the hospital. So we can go to the next slide. Unfortunately, again, this patient reports even more severe symptoms. Over the course of 48 hours, the patient has reported um, worsening rectum pain and that they are unable to sit, sleep, or have bowel movements comfortably. Um, so they're in a pretty severe pain just systemically, and the lesions are very um, uncomfortable and less than ideal, I should say. Um, so upon a uh, physical examination, there is severe and intense uh, rectal and anal inflammation with shallow ulcerations and um, more lesions across the chest, back, legs, arms, and palms, essentially um, really anywhere uh, the, these lesions developed. Um, as you can see, there were more, there was more treatment, um, uh, uh, more treatment uh, presented uh, in terms of doxycycline stool softeners to try to make those bowel movements um, less uh, unpleasant and some pain medications as well. Um, I do have a question in the chat um, from Adam. You can you feel free to unmute or I'm happy to read it out as well. Sure, yeah, when, <clears throat> when this patient hit the, the hospital, I mean, we had a negative gonorrhea and chlamydia um, test, um, but they, you know, I think the, the um, acyclovir and balacyclovir, you know, I, I can make a lot of sense of that because it kind of looks a little herpetic if, if we didn't know about pox viruses. Um, but the, the ceftriaxone, I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, what your thoughts are on, on what they might be trying to treat or, or kind of why it was on that. Like, what are we empirically? Sure. Yeah. Might be? That's a fantastic question. So the really great thing about this case that um, uh, we will include in our follow-up is that they had a really great section about all the differential diagnoses that they considered um, upon, upon presentation prior to uh, monkeypox. So I think they almost were um, proactively trying to treat um, anything that it could be if it was not monkeypox. Again, I will preface this that I'm actually not a practicing clinician. Um, so in terms of when to initiate medica medication, I am not an expert on that. But I do think that at this point, the care team was trying to uh, be proactive in their approach to treatment and potentially just cover a broad range of, of STIs, STDs that this could potentially be and hope that it was not monkeypox. Spoiler, um, it was. Um, so sorry if that did not exactly answer your question, Adam, but there are a lot of great details in the case itself that I'm sure um, could provide further detail on that. I wonder if they didn't actually do a rectal swab for gonorrhea, which I see often. Um, they will just get a urine for gonorrhea and then the patient comes in with proctitis and then we end up treating while we're waiting for further testing that ultimately comes up negative. That makes sense. That could definitely be what they're trying to treat is when they kept them on doxy and afterwards. So if they're, mm -hmm. they're just kind of waiting on that rectal GC to come back, because yeah. it did sound like that was one of the main things that brought him in was like just really intense pain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as this patient is having these symptoms, they are admitted to the hospital. Um, so that does change this case a little bit in the sense that this individual was able to stay in the hospital. Um, but I have some questions I'd love to pose to the group after I give the summary um, that may relate to what somebody would do if they weren't in the hospital per se. Um, so to summarize, this patient initially presented with painless genital and Asian lesions and reported recent um, unprotected sexual encounters with new partners. 
um, the PCP, they visited, evaluated them for common um, STIs and was not necessarily instructed to isolate or limit contact. Again, this individual has uh, several roommates and pets. Um, just wanted to put that out there. And the diagnosis of monkeypox um, was not considered necessarily until the patient uh, presented again to the hospital with extreme symptoms in which they were isolated in the hospital appropriately. Um, so just to reiterate, I'm looking for advice on determining when um, testing is appropriate, best practices for contact tracing, quarantining, and isolation. Um, so happy to open the floor to anybody if, if they have any questions or I have some questions as well. So before we, um, you know, if there are, does anybody need additional information from Emily? I think it was a pretty complex case. Do you have any questions? Um, she may or may not have those answers, but is there anything else you'd like to know about this, this scenario? Did they do an, an HSV culture or a PCR? They didn't. I can't remember. Um, yeah. They did not. Um, I think mm -hmm. they just went with his word and the fact that he's reported recurrent uh, OS, oh, HSP. Oh, that's right. He was on Valtrex. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And I, in the, in the literature, there was no, in terms of the patient, which I think is really interesting is there was no reported like bodily herpetic outbreaks, no genital herpetic outbreaks, only oral. So I think that's interesting when we think about, um, herpes as a differential diagnosis. If somebody is reporting oral HSV, um, would we consider their genital ulcerations and lesions typical presentations of their HSV? I, I, that's something I, I would think about because if they would never have any lesions on their genitals, can we consider a genital lesion as HSV? <laughs> we'll keep it on the list. I'm sure, you know, it's, it's, across the literature with all these different differential diagnoses, I'm sure that would be incredibly helpful. And was this case before monkeypox was known to be in the U.S.? So this case was published um, August 11th. Now, as we know, um, that has nothing to do with when the case was submitted or, or when they saw the patient. Um, I'm going to sift through here and see if I can find um, any information on... I think it's the first case in the U.S., Oh wow! Was this was this one? Um, there's a part towards the end where um, one of the docs who was seeing the patient kind of woke up one morning and and saw the news out of Europe. They're like, "Oh, we're having monkeypox outbreak," and they're like, "Oh my gosh, that's what this mm -hmm. is." So probably a little bit earlier in um, the development of monkeypox in the U.S., which of course you know we we might have had different. Um, different steps taken, you know, if this patient presented now versus, you know, several months ago. I do have some information on what, on the contact tracing and exposure investigation, what they did do, if we want to talk about that, or, um, and we can talk about what we think they should have done um, now that we know a lot more about monkeypox, if, if, if anybody is interested. I'd be really curious, and I don't know if there's any follow up on like if they did like IgM titers on closer contacts or anything like that. Is sure, um, yeah. So, upon awaiting the confirmation of the monkeypox uh, diagnosis again, which I will repeat, was not until they were already in the hospital, so not upon that initial presentation to the PCP's office. They began the um, contact tracing and exposure investigation to identify and subsequently assess the risk um, for people who were com confirmed exposures. Um, so I think that's pretty that's pretty much best practices. Um, and I invite Adam and Casey to step in here in terms of, you know, when we're waiting for a diagnosis and we're considering monkeypox, you know, what's the best practice in terms of initiating um, that contact tracing? Because, you know, as we've seen with COVID, there's a lot of scare tactics going on. People get frightened. And I, I'm sure, you know, as clinicians, everybody wants to make sure we're not, you know, jumping the gun here, but we do want to, you know, care for our patients as best as possible. So I'll say what we've started doing. We have any time that we're doing a monkeypox swab, 
we can basically just give them this whole packet and it, it has um, like a contact tracing sheet where they just, you know, anybody that you can think of between now and when the test comes back that you've had significant contact with, and there's some verbiage of like what that means, um, just to write that down so that you can kind of quickly contact people if it is positive. Um, there's like the TPOX consent, the patient diary, and then we include a tape measure um, is we, we're trying to get pictures of the rash afterwards. Um, so we just, you know, if we're doing the swab, I just give them this, this whole packet. Um, so that's kind of how we've been trying to balance that. Now, some folks are super proactive and they're, they're already texting anybody that they've been with. They're like, hey, I'm getting tested for monkeypox, you know, get yourself checked. And, um, but, you know, I think it's a, a little bit case by case in terms of the, the uh, social situation that somebody's in and kind of what it means to have monkeypox. Um, yeah, I'd be curious to hear what other folks are, are doing and recommending for folks. Has anyone in the audience seen any monkeypox cases and have tried to feel through any of this? Yeah, even if you don't have details, um, if you have seen one or, you know, seen a case, go ahead and just, you know, put yes in the chat for us just so we can get a sense of, um, you know, what's really happening out there. And Adam, I love to hear about that, like take home package you're providing with your patients. I'm sure it would be really helpful um, if we touch base offline and see what you keep in there, um, because I'm sure it will be really great, you know, in terms of if people have the funding to do so to provide that to their patients. Yeah, I mean, it's a couple of things off the CDC and we've kind of pulled around with, you know, printing off some of the flyers and patient, patient handouts um, that go with that. Um, but I think the biggest thing was, was trying to get the TPOX consent either signed before they leave or just, okay, you have this at home um, just in case. Um, uh, the trickier part is, you know, when folks come to us after they've been diagnosed to, to urgent care or the ER, um, and then we have to figure out how to get these consents signed without them coming into the office. Right. And that I think will be really great to talk about. So next week, which is our, I think our vaccination and treatment session. So we'll talk a lot about that also. So stay tuned for that. And thanks for, for sharing about those, those packets, Adam, those are fantastic. And I can see overwhelmingly in the chat, um, most people haven't seen any cases, but if you have, we'd love to hear from you um, and feel free to pop in um, if so. Okay, so I can move on continuing to- Hang on, Becky. Hold on one second. Yeah. I, was, I asked Becky if she'd be willing to kind of oh, share good. their Thank isolation you. contact tracing, what they did with their cases, and she is. So Becky, if you, Hi there. Oh, I'd love to hear what other people are doing. So we had, well, I'm an Alder Health. Hi there, I'm a nurse practitioner here. I, um, we use the um, health department. So we just gave it to them. So that was, I don't know if that's a cheat, but we all, we absolutely told um, both clients that were here to, to contact one, um, got it through um, uh, multiple uh, gay man, multiple sexual partners, put the word out, texted, was, was not at all unwilling. The other um, was much more hesitant about telling me how he had got it um, and told me that there was no one to contact. So um, the health department, I'm sure got more to the bottom of that. Um, claimed that that only had one heterosexual um, partner and didn't think he got it through her. Um, so he had really no idea. Um, and he really came to me kind of late in his monkeypox. So it, he had already started to um, scab over by the time I saw him. Sad thing is, was he was out working out in the community, showed up to us in shorts and a t-shirt um, with, had not been covering, had not, has to wear mask at work, thank goodness, but um, had really been out in the community um, with his monkeypox. 
Yeah, DOH is actually don't feel bad cheating and sending to them. Um, we, we all do that, but I have seen their contact tracing forms for monkeypox. For each patient, it's like 30 pages long. So as the cases increase, expect that they are really going to struggle to keep up if the cases increase. Let's hope that they don't and they just drop off and this goes away. But if they do, expect that um, we'll have to become a little more active as we become uh, more vigilant and see more. But, you know, Adam talked about a case two weeks ago where the the wife of the patient expected they were in a monogamous relationship, but the patient was actually MSM. And I just got another case me over the weekend, I believe. Yeah, it's Wednesday. So over the weekend where patient clearly had monkeypox, meeting all the signs, married, pregnant wife. Um, after they called me, I made them go back in and ask and the patient was actually stepping out on wife and having sex with men on the side and likely where they got it. And I think, you know, I've seen a, a bunch of cases similar to this with HIV or syphilis over the years. So I suspect we'll see more of this putting um, non-suspecting partners at risk. And I've been encouraging OBs to be more vigilant. Um, if patient presents with this, you know, be very concerned. So, um, Casey or Adam, do any of you have it? Do either of you have any input on Emily's question or anyone else? The question is in the chat. I think there still is a concern about auto inoculation with the um, with shaving or with contact lenses. I mean, these are you know these are kind of higher risk areas. Um, so whether somebody who's kind of scratching a mosquito bite on their shoulder versus touching their eyeball. I mean, there's different levels of risk. You really don't want this in your eye. Um, I, I don't think we have a clear answer in the, in the science or the data to, um, to know if auto inoculation is kind of relevant, like in terms of like where exactly it, it starts off and shows up. Um, it would kind of make sense just with, you know, with, um, like genital and, and anal lesions being, you know, some of the, the major ones that we see. And then that's, you know, in, you know, it's transmitted through a lot of close contact during sex. So it kind of makes sense that there'd be some auto inoculation, but I don't know, is anybody aware of anything more definitive than, than kind of our hunches? I don't think we have anything more definitive, but I, I do know that one of the bigger concerns is with um, ocular monkeypox, and I, I apologize, I don't know all the details, but it is, if a patient comes in and you suspect that they have it in their eye, they are a candidate for treatment, and we can talk more about that in two weeks. So that's really why they're trying to get people to not touch their eyes. So, you know, if you're undressing bandages, we recommend you wash your hands. If you have lesions on your hands, just don't use contacts, please. Um, and last week's or two weeks ago, the case, we saw that lesion initially looked like nothing. Um, so hand, hand hygiene. Never wrong to wash your hands. Yeah. Thanks so, so much also for sharing, Becky. I, we love to hear about what everybody else is doing out there in the community um, with boots on the ground. So thanks so much for sharing. <clears throat> Now, I find it very um, interesting because this individual reported having roommates and um, pets as well. So I, I'm interested as, you know, the literature pumps out um, what that risk is for those people who dwell in the same household um, as, as this other individual. Yeah, I'm curious about that too, if it's, um, you know, some of the clear my household transmissions are usually like adults to kids. Mm -hmm. um, I know that one of the ones kind of in the literature before this outbreak was kind of a, a mother taking care of a child that had it um, that ended up developing monkeypox. So the, you know, that's a different level of 
contact if you're trying to comfort a, a sick child versus kind of, you know, we're eating dinner together and we're roommates and maybe we sit on the same couch at different times, but there's not a lot of, you know, physical contact. So, I, um, go, go ahead. ahead no, um, I just wanted to, um, you know, I, I wanted, you mentioned that our next topic is going to be, um, I believe it's treatment and um, vaccination. Um, and as we're getting close to one o'clock, I thought if we, you know, before we kind of wrap up the case and any last questions for Casey on today's topic, I was just wondering if anyone would be willing to share any specific questions that you may already have um, regarding treatment and vaccination. You know, if you have some questions we could use that to kind of formulate what we'll cover and how we'll help, how we'll handle our discussion in two weeks. So I'll give you a minute or so if you have specific questions or examples of good or bad practices around treatment and vaccination, go ahead and pop it into the chat or unmute and let us know. Okay, thank you, Justin. So yeah. um, Emily is, um, is really leading um, our hub expert team and providing them with information as they prepare their flash talks. So I am sure she will make sure that we're talking, we're looking into site reactions. Yeah, it's yeah. it's interesting you say that. I've seen very intense pictures of, because I, I believe the vaccination is in the forearm versus where it's usually in the upper arm and they're receiving little like welt, like, well, I don't even know how yeah, to describe I've it. I've seen some pretty significant ones. And, you know, in the one study, it was 100% of people had some reaction, but um, a lot of itching and, you know, there's still a little bit of discoloration, even weeks later, it's, it's not obvious, but we've started having people request their second shot in the upper arm, but intradermal, um, which, you know, it's not where you usually do it, but I think you know, the, I'm wondering if like the reason why we do it in the forearm is because it was just easier to pull up your sleeve for the TB read. So we're used to doing intradermal things in the arm, like in the forearm. I don't know if there's anything special about it. And I feel like this was addressed somewhere in the depths of one of those vaccine documents, but does anybody know offhand if it matters which skin gets the, the shot or where I'm special. <laughs> I'm happy to find out for our next session yeah. as well. And yeah. we'll Thank you. That. Yeah, we'll make sure that that's covered. Um, any other questions, um, challenges regarding treatment and vaccination before I, you know, ask our, our hub team for a quick summary of where, where we've been today? All right, well, Casey, did you have anything, any last points that you wanted to make around this case um, or Adam before we let Emily wrap up her part? I didn't have anything specific, but on the mammal question, we do know that pox viruses spread to mammals. So CDC for isolation is recommending that someone else watch your pets, mm -hmm. um, that you do not keep them in the home because they can spread to them even though they don't get sick and then spread to other people. Um, so that's any mammal, pretty much, because mm -hmm. it is very easily spread. Yeah, I kind of wondered about that, too, because you've probably been in contact with this mammal before you got diagnosed, and then are you transmitting it, or should you just isolate it with your animal? I have no idea, right? <laughs> and um, uh, uh, Trish, the other doctor that I work with, her husband's a vet. And so she's asking him about like, you know, are veterinarians being aware of this? And he's like, the what? So I don't think that there's awareness on the veterinary end of this. Um, I, I was going to say, Adam. Yeah, oh, you're here. I keep it. I keep. Yeah, I came in late, but um, I keep asking him and he's like, nope, we're not getting any any recommendations. <laughs> nope, no recommendations. And, you know, he would be like the contact person for their clinic and they're not hearing anything from the state health department. So um, they have not had any cases they're concerned about thus far um, because obviously I have forced it into his brain, but um, I don't think that side, I think it's just a giant black box. All right, Emily, any last closing sure. thoughts? Clothing, excuse me, closing thoughts. Um, just reported that this 
patient had their last lesion two weeks after initial presentation. And then upon that, the individual had to wait for that lesion to heal, to uh, be, be released from isolation. So just emphasize that the importance of this can be a long process. It can be undesirable, but it's necessary for public safety. And um, we're excited to provide you guys with up and coming info as we have it and look forward to uh, seeing you guys again. Yes. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, don't forget you'll receive an email shortly and it contains a link to the session evaluation. Um, we will also share our participant resources. If you are claiming CME for being here today, you do need to complete that evaluation in its entirety. Um, if you're not, we'd still appreciate your input so we can continue to improve these sessions. Um, and we will see you again on October 5th. The flash talk again will be treatment and vaccination. Um, you know, Emily jumped in to help us with the case today, and so she was pretty intimate with this. If anyone else wants to share a case, um, please don't feel that you would need to lead the discussion around the case. We would just want you to talk about, hey, this is what I'm seeing, and, you know, I wanted to share how I handled it, or how would you have handled it? So, you know, no um, pressure if you're doing a case, but if you have a case or questions or a scenario, especially around treatment and vaccination, um, please let us know. It's echo at psu.edu. And um, unless there are any last questions, enjoy the extra four minutes on this gorgeous, this, this gorgeous last day of summer day. <laughs>